Hello, everyone, and welcome to From the Ground Up podcast. So I'm really excited to talk about something this week. We have CritterCon Live coming at you May 2nd, and that's an event that I decided to put together along with uh, when I was talking on the phone with Colin of Crosstown Exotics. I realized that a lot of these animal educators, reptile educators, these people who are going out to schools and libraries and teaching you know, the next generation about these animals that we all love, they actually aren't able to do their job during this time because obviously we cannot gather in public. So uh, I have decided to put together a virtual event with the help of Snake Discovery, Roaming Reptiles, Crosstown Exotics, and Cole Black Exotics. The four of them are coming at you uh, 20 minutes each, a five to 10 minute Q&A after, and it's only $5. So if you could, please consider doing that. The link will be in the description and uh, it's going to be a great time. And if you do anything for this show, if you ever want to support me, this is the one time, please, because um, this would help them out a lot. And uh, and don't worry if you guys are in a tight spot right now. I'm actually going to do a giveaway tomorrow. So that is April 28th. Um, Tuesday, we are going to start a giveaway in which we'll end Thursday. And then we will announce uh, five winners of free tickets. So that's also another way to get in. So uh, I hopefully will see you guys there. And uh, thank you guys so much. If you guys just want to you know, if you can't buy a ticket, if you tell someone who has a kid or tell a science teacher or someone who who may use a CritterCon as a as a resource, please. And uh, if any of the other guys, as far as snake breeders and stuff like that, uh, want to sponsor, uh, we are sponsored by uh, Superior Shipping Supplies, as well as Morelia Python Radio and SNJ Reptiles. So thank you so much for your sponsorship, guys. And we're going to get to the show. So today we are bringing back corn snake talk. It's been so long. How can I stray so far from my native uh, colubrid, will you say, or one of my favorite species in the world? So today we are going to have on a breeder. She's from Ohio. It is Laura from Wind Serpents. Laura, thank you so much for being here. I just knocked my cord off and almost knocked over my beard. Hi. Well, What's up? almost is important. So. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, definitely don't don't want to don't want to lose the dragon milk. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. So, how did you first get interested in reptiles? So, um, obviously, like most people, I I liked reptiles when I was a kid. Um, I was absolutely obsessed with dinosaurs. You know, everybody went through the dinosaur phase. Um, and I uh, I don't know. I, I begged for a pet lizard. Um, my my one of my favorite animals was like the monitor lizards you'd see on Animal Planet, like the Komodo dragons and stuff. All those were so cool. But I also thought that all of them were big and scary and dangerous. So I didn't think that was possible to have in your house. Um, so I never bothered asking for one of those. But I, I begged for lizards and stuff as a kid, and I was just not allowed. I, I kept getting the, you know, oh you'll get salmonella and die, you know. Um, so I didn't have pets until I was a teenager. Um, my first pet was a bird and then it just kind of went from there. Um, anyway, so my, my fast forward, like 15 years plus, um, I am rocking with those gamer chairs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I used to stream games. Um, but anyways, uh, Kyle and I met, we, we lived together for like a year or so and we had a pet, we had a cat and I was like, I want something for me because, you know, they were bonded and, you know, I wanted something that I could interact with that, you know, maybe liked me best. Um, <laughs> we, went, <laughs> we went to the zoo. Um, I believe it was the Columbus Zoo, but I'm not sure on that. I think I tagged the wrong zoo in the post, but I saw this cute little rough green snake and I was like, that's adorable. I want one of those. And so I did some research and I was like, okay, maybe I don't want one of those, you know, they, they and it's funny they that you're in a zoo and this is a native <laughs> animal that like most yeah, it's people a native species. upon. Yeah. I, I, it was, I mean, I, I didn't know at the time that it was a native species. So I was just like, oh, it's a cute little green snake and it has a smile. Like, so, mm. you know, that would be cool. And I, I never thought about snakes when I was a kid, you know, I, it just, it never occurred to me that that was a thing I could get as a pet. Um, I think if I, if I had asked, it would have been an instant no because snakes are the devil. That was the kind of household I was raised in. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, we talked about it and he was like, okay, well, you'd get a snake because 
you know, they're not noisy. They don't, they're not messy, whatever. So I started researching and I discovered corn snakes and I discovered how many different colors and patterns and stuff you could get. And I just was obsessed. I, I thought they were just the coolest thing ever. And this was only five years ago. This was 2015. Um, so I'm, I'm very new compared to a lot of the people you've had on this, on this podcast. So, uh, yeah, but I, 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 bought one i got a, a cayenne fire from smr um yeah it, it, he was amazing um and i had to have more and i kept kept trying to convince him like why i should be allowed to get more snakes so that i could breed them because i wanted to make all these cool you know colors and patterns that i couldn't find like i had ideas of, for like morphs that didn't exist i was like okay well i could just make them and so he, it took some convincing but finally he he was on board. Um, he offered space in the closet, which I promptly took over almost entirely. <laughs> so now we have a closet full of snakes. So. so does he show any interest as far as keeping or? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, part of what inspired um, the idea of, of getting a snake as a pet was his handle, his gaming handle is snake bite. So mm -hmm. like, I was like, Oh, it's funny. Cause it's like, you know, snake bite. Ha ha. Um, but yeah, he, he doesn't really like, take care of them like I don't expect him to clean or feed or anything like that but like you know I'll hold him he's interested in what you know what's going on um so a lot of times I'll say you know oh we're expecting blah 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 and it's really it's just me so <laughs> every now and then he'll ask me for updates like oh what's going on what are you breeding now and I'm like you know oh this and this and this and he's just like oh that's cool okay so he's kind of okay. hands off but yeah. well that's good at least you don't have someone who is uh He's not mm. against the snakes, you know, or anything yeah. like that. So. Yeah, that would, that would be rough. Um, I think I just wouldn't have them in the first place if, if that was the case, though. So so how many or how big is your collection now? It's pretty small. Um, my total is about 40. Um, I'm, I'm a little male heavy right now. I really need some more females, but I just I have nowhere to put them. So I'm actually kind of running into this this spot where I don't know if I can keep all of my holdbacks because I don't think I can make room for all of them. So I might have some things available at some point. So you're gonna make a few hard decisions in the in the near I might future. Have to. Uh, it's some of it's gonna depend. Um, yeah, some of some of it's gonna depend on like how much convincing I can do on uh, maybe taking over more space in the apartment. So. Mm. Yeah, I hear for you. Reference, for reference, the cat has his own bedroom. <laughs> so, so. Yeah. now to be fair, I've taken over space in there as well. Um, I have a storage container full of bedding and extra cages and some other stuff. Excuse me. Um, my mouse freezer is in that room. So, you know, I've taken over a little bit of space. I took over the bathroom. That's now my incubator room. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm pushing it a little bit. So. Nice. I was I was gonna ask you if you had a separate uh, if you had an incubator or somewhere to, to incubate in. Yeah, um, I actually built a new one this year. Um, I took a, a fifty or not fifty, uh, what the hundred fifty quart. The, it's like the the big like I don't know if it's rubber made. I forget what brand it is, but it's just like that the big cooler that's like huge. Um, cut a couple of holes in it. Delta's laying the next week or so. Awesome. I'm glad she's doing well. I miss that snake. Oh, she's so good. She's such a sweetheart. Um, I sold Chris uh, my buff Tessera that I had gotten mm -hmm. from Dawn. Um, and I, I, I ran out of projects for her. So, and I knew he liked buff. So I've got a couple of kids. Yeah, anyway. it's funny. When I, uh, when I was thinking about maybe like selling my male buff or I don't know what to do with exactly what's going on with my buff project, Chris is uh, the first person I, that came mm -hmm. to mind. Yep, every time. Yeah, I don't I don't know anybody that's done more with buff, so yeah. So was there anything in particular that first caught your eye uh, project wise? Um red, anything red. Uh Which is I, easy in corn snakes, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because um when I first started looking, I went to a couple local reptile shows and that was where I met Amy Zirkle of Zirkle Reptile Company. She was showing at um I think that was at the Columbus show, so that's all Ohio reptile show. And I, I was asking around and somebody sent me to her because they were like, oh, she knows about corn snakes. And I asked her about blood reds because I had seen pictures from Dawn's book. I had seen pictures, you know, on the Internet of blood reds. And they were just like amazing to me. And she told me 
oh no, you don't want those. They don't eat. And I'm like, what? Okay. So yeah, I found out later that that was wrong, but uh, you know, eh, some of those old rumors, they stick around with some, some of the older keepers. Um, and she does way more than corn snakes. She doesn't really mess with corn snakes. They do like old world rats. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know I how recent she has bred corn snakes. I mean, because that matters as far it's as. It's been a while, I bet. Um, I know she's done like, she's well, like. Well, blood ribs old. at least. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, back in the day, that, that was a, a legitimate concern when they were first, you know, available. They they had a hard time getting them to feed. Um, Evict the cat. Oh, yeah. He's probably running around somewhere. Um, but uh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, it's like there's a, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of things like that as far as I mean, but but I see it somewhat as far as uh, anything with with keys lineage that I have in my collection is yeah. a little bit trickier. Yeah, I there's definitely some lines that still have problems. So, you know, um, but I I wanted I wanted like the reddest snake I could get, and I, at some point I ended up contacting Don Soderberg at or is it Soderberg? Have I been saying it wrong? This Soderberg? Time? I don't know. Soderberg? Whatever. Don. Everybody knows who Don is. Yeah. Everybody in Corn Snakes knows who Don is. Um, and he he told me, oh, well, if you want red, if you want really, really red, you want the Cayenne Fire. And so he sold me a male. And he was amazing and just super, super bright. Now I've got kids from him. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was the first snake that I bought because I wanted something that was just going to be super bright red. And I wanted projects that included that bright red color. So one of my first kind of ideas was to put that into lavender. And that's what I'm working on now. I have a, a female. It was the only one from that clutch that survived. I had, I had two. One, one failed um, right out of the egg, just passed. Oh, but uh, I do have one female that is very bright red. Um, I could probably send you a picture of her. So what is the, um, can you explain a little bit what a cayenne fire is? So cayenne fires are a line bred red factor uh, fire. So it's amel and diffused. Um, it's pretty high quality diffused. Most people would consider it blood red. The distinction between those is complicated. Technically blood red is more than just diffused. But anyway, these are high quality diffused amel and they're they just mature into these beautiful fire engine red color snakes um completely patternless they have like a little white on their chin but that's about it uh, and a little bit of white on the belly um so the one that i got is a, a super red factor um so that means he's got two copies it, it's an incomplete dominant gene so if you have one copy you get kind of red if you got two you get really red so i had really red and what does that do when paired with something that's, you know, the purplish color of lavender? Well, in theory, it would make it pink. Um, we don't really know. Um, I, I mean, we've seen corns that, like, we've seen lavender corns that look like they're probably red factor. Um, I know Glenn Brooksy, um, Brooksy, you know who I'm talking about, Glenn. Yeah. Um, he has a lavender corn, I think it's a hypo lavender, that is very pink. Like it has just this peach color to its background um, all down the back that I, I, I swear that has to be red factor. So that's what I'm expecting. Like the first generation of mine to look like is kind of like that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, we could be surprised, um, but we've seen how snows look uh, with red factor, obviously coral salmon. Um, you know, some of those salmon snows are just insane, like how bright they are. Um, and if you, it's funny because if you put too much red into it, they just turn orange. Um, mm. That was something that uh, I think it was Marsha at Poppy Corns. Um, she messaged uh, Dawn at one point and was like, "We we went too far. We added too many red factor reddening genes into a snow, and it just turned orange." <laughs> so you don't want to overdo it, apparently. Yeah, I guess there's kind of a a point where, and you'll see that in a lot of species where. Um, things like pattern and color just go, or that goes to like some default, some yeah. default state, which apparently in course yeah. snakes seems to be orange. A lot of the times they're like, uh, well, you ever see? Well, in most snakes, if you, you pile too many morphs together, you just get a white snake. Like it, they just, everything cancels out. How many like, yeah, there's a bunch of like pale yellowish ball pythons out there. That's mm -hmm. like what happens when you put all the incomplete dominant genes together. Yep. Yeah. And it seems like, uh, 
in corn snakes, I mean, though, there's a lot of different things that are going on as far as uh, you have so many recessives that you don't know about, then you may pop anything out. Uh, have you yeah. ever popped out anything interesting that you didn't expect? Yes. Um, okay. So I don't know how many people are familiar with um, Jessica Kimball, um, cornbread reptiles, back in, I think it was in 2015. Um, she hatched out of uh, what she thought was a very bright red motley male. And he was huge. It was absolutely massive. It was like a 1700 gram corn. And he wasn't fat. For, for <laughs> he, was, he was huge. For like, reference, adult adult corn snakes are typically, you know, 300 to 500 grams, would yeah, you my, say? My biggest males are probably about 500 at most. And yeah, he's just, he's massive. I, I wish I'd had space because he would be here. Um, I wanted that snake so badly, but I just, I can't, I can't house him. And I can't, you know, ethically breed him to any of my females none of them are nearly big enough so um <laughs> but she bred she bred this and she had a, a a normal female that well it was supposedly a normal female um named norma um she was decently sized so uh hatched out a whole bunch of weird hypo things that were really pretty like really really pretty and some of them were anery so they were obviously anery um, so she got a bunch of these like really nice looking ghosts and a bunch of just nice looking hypos. And at some point, a couple of them became available. So I bought a pair of these and I bred them together. And then these weird orange things popped out and they looked a lot like, um, you know, Steve's orange things, the weird castagna allele. Like they're, no, is it I, like I Mandarin looking? Yeah, yeah, kind of Mandarin. It's, it's like it, instead of AML, it would be hypo. So they, they look like castanias. I think they're castanias or at least something in that complex. Um, but I still haven't proven what they are. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, uh, that cool, was an though. interesting to ha thing to hatch. Because at first I thought, oh, I hatched a bunch of weird looking ghosts. And then they slowly turned red. And I was like, what? What is this? <laughs> what did I just hatch? So, um, yeah, we'll have to see what, what happens uh, with that. Do you have any idea of the, the background of that girl? Not a clue. Um, the female, I believe, was... I'm not sure where she got her. Um, the male was a Craigslist find. So and we. So think, this is totally by chance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally random. Um, and he was... I mean, he was really pretty red. And some of the babies, like, they kind of started turning colors like him. So I don't... He wasn't obviously homozygous. Um, Castania, because all the other, all the, all the other patchlings that we've seen from that pairing, none of them have it. So I, I apparently was the only one that, that managed to get two that have it. Um, I, I think that it came from him, but who knows? And it's possible that could have been, you know, produced by Steve, you know, forever ago. Who knows? Yeah, I think you know, uh, it's a Craigslist animal. It could be from anybody. <laughs> Yeah, so. I mean, at, at the end of the day, there's there's only so many producers of corn snakes at scale. Even if someone, even if someone went to PetSmart to get a, an animal, mm. I mean, well, uh, some of that depends on what part of the country you're in. Um, yeah, of course. In in this region, all of that's controlled by um, reptiles by Mac. So they they supply all of the PetSmarts in like the like the northeast. Um, so like all of Ohio, everything that's here is, is from reptiles by Mac. And I know that because I used to work for them. Um, but I'm saying was, like, as far as you can get genetics from almost anywhere, I mean, yeah, like you can, yeah. you can get like a annery ghost stripe, you can find ghost stripes or annery stripes and sure. all different types of things in a pet store. And I mean, even like some of the big breeders, like they're wholesaling. I mean, if you think Steve isn't wholesaling out, <laughs> he's probably sending big numbers to other breeders and like other like resellers. So it's very possible, like, you know, it could have ended up in a pet store that somebody bought, you know, anything's possible. Yeah. So can we talk about that a little bit? I mean, you hinted what? at it. Uh, oh, so you work for, back? yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I didn't last long. Uh, I was, I was <laughs> way too new. Um, I was just, I was fascinated by everything and it was, it was bad. It was really bad. Um, so what were you doing there? Uh, so I was the other person working. Well, they had, I think they had three people total. I was full time. Um, my job was to clean baby cages and uh, I helped with feeding sometimes too, but I didn't usually do as much with that. But that was literally all I did all day was just clean cages. Uh, I learned how to do it very efficiently, very quickly. Um, wasn't quick enough. Uh, at some point, they were just like, 
yeah, this isn't really working out. And I was like, yeah, probably not. You're not an <laughs> inefficient shit cleaner. <laughs> now, to be fair, at the time, their turnover was like, boom, 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 boom. They were just like hiring people like crazy and letting people go like crazy. So I don't feel so bad about being asked to leave. But I I was too new. I was just, I was way too new. Um, I, I could, could not, not imagine could not how brutal it would be to do that for like eight hours a day. But you know what? It was like the best time of my life. I just, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I just probably should have been faster. <laughs> and were you with all the like, baby colubrids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in the colubrid department. So like I'm looking at these baby corn snakes and I'm like, oh, what morph is this? Like I was still, you know, learning like how to identify morphs and like learning about the different species. They had, you know, different king snakes. And, you know, I learned very quickly which of the the babies were the most aggressive or, you know, defensive. Um I, I swear some of them were just straight mean. <laughs> well, I can <laughs> imagine like things. going through so many different enclosures every day. You have ones that are jumping out. You yeah. Have ones oh, yeah. yeah. I, I learned very quickly to be very comfortable getting bit by baby snakes. So, yeah, that that was very helpful in desensitizing me up to to getting bit. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, really, how long were you keeping snakes before you did that? Oh, I hadn't gotten my first one yet. Oh, I jumped right damn. in. Yep. So were you like thinking <laughs> of getting a snake at the time? And then yeah. we're like, yeah, let's just Yeah, I was planning on it. Um, I knew it was something I wanted to do. And then I I I don't remember how I found out they were hiring, but I I found them somehow and I was just like, Yes, I want to do that. I want to get, you know, really get into it and learn about baby snakes and, and learn. I was hoping I'd learn about breeding. I I didn't learn anything about breeding there. <laughs> <laughs> do they do they breed there on a yeah. oh yeah. yeah uh they breed on like a weird schedule so they have um at the time it was like three or four groups um that they would have in brumation at any given time um so they would bring up a new group they'd breed them uh babies would hatch they'd breed another group that's just kind of how it went so it was it was very cyclical um i don't know how things are now i know they've expanded so they have like a whole new building and like way more space i think they've ramped up quite a bit um they are probably the biggest producer at this point in the u.s I what do you think numbers wise was going on when you were there um at the time at any given time we had about 2500 babies um in the colubrids um most of that was corn snakes i'd say probably about a third or so was different species of king so they had like floridanas and like desert kings and um, they had a few rat snakes, like they had like yellow rats, but they weren't very popular. So they didn't have huge numbers of those. Um, and then they'd have like checkered garters, um, kind of a mix. It was about half albino, half normal. Um, and most of those just got wholesaled to China. So they were, they were buying those up left and right, especially the albinos. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was so funny that's... because we'd also get like wholesale groups in from like overseas and like from other places. And I mean, like we'd get like a thousand at a time. It was just insane. Yeah. That's wild. Just to think on that scale yep. as far as, yeah, but it's yeah. also, <laughs> like I said, I, I learned how to be efficient really quickly. Um, I just, you know, wasn't good enough for them, but you know, when you've got 40 hours a week to clean 2,500 tubs, you, you get on it. <laughs> You know? Yeah, that's just, that's a lot. So what, what carried over as far as from that experience to your private keeping? Um, the bedding that I use, um, some of the cleaners, like we use chlorhexidine and I really liked it. I liked how it smelled because it doesn't smell really, really harsh. So like, I, I actually have a bottle right here, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, otherwise just like generally the way that I just dump and wipe and fill and put things back. Um, it's a little different because obviously I've got more stuff in my tubs than they did. They were very, very, very bare. Um, but it's, it's similar. So my baby, I mean, baby rats don't it, have much room. So was it nice at least to uh, not have to be so quick or, you yeah. know, not have to rush <laughs> through everything and you can actually enjoy your animals and just yeah. hang out? I, I definitely enjoy that part now, um, being able to just take my time You know, I can put on some music or turn on a podcast. I've got like five more to listen to um, and just kind of take my time. But if I needed to, I, I could fly through it. So, you know, I, I definitely built some good habits. But 
Yeah, and you you had mentioned a little bit about betting and all that. So can you go over like general setup? I mean, are you a rack keeper? What kind of substrate yeah. do you use? All that stuff. Um, I am a rack keeper. I generally prefer Santa Chip. Um, it's just it's easier to clean. It it's very absorbent. Um, the smaller pieces, if they ingest a few pieces, I'm not too worried about it because they can pass it very easily. It's not gonna like you know turn sideways and like stick. Um, I do worry about them, in, you know, ingesting like a mouthful of the stuff because it will stick together. But for the most part, I don't seem to have too much problem with that. Um, I've been thinking about going back to shredded Aspen just because it's cheaper. Like the cost of Santa Chip right now is insane. I used to get it for like 13 bucks, a, like for a big, you know, 2.2 quart bag. And now it's like 40, which is hmm. absurd. So, and do you buy it wholesale like PJ Murphy's or can you get it from a different source? I don't have a large enough collection to get it wholesale. So like I'll get four at a time. Um, the last place that I ordered was TSK Supply. Um, they had the best price and he offered to kind of bundle them together in a way that kind of saved me a little bit money on shipping. So that was the cheapest place that I could find it. Um, and if I if I order it again, it'll probably be through there. So, um, But otherwise... I mean, it would be a lot cheaper for me to go to the shredded Aspen because I could just, you know, pop into Rural King and probably find a big bale. So I don't know. I, I haven't decided what I want to do. I still have two bags worth. Um, I've been avoiding doing deep cleans because of the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Paper towels are precious. So <laughs> I, I recently did a, a deep clean where I didn't really deep, deep clean, but you know, I tried to make the most of the paper towels I was using. So and and on Sandy Chip, it's nice because it really like collects all the moisture and stuff yeah. like that. And you can be pretty conservative with uh, yeah. the amount of bedding and the amount of paper towels and stuff that you use. Yeah, big time. I I wish it was less dusty. Um, and the last batch that I had. I don't know if it came from that or if it came from some Mongol or not Mongolian. Um, uh, I, I got some leaves to put in the baby rack because I was like, oh, it'll be, you know, enrichment. You know, they can hide under it and feel secure. Um, I ended up with wood mites, which are not harmful, but they're annoying and ugly. Mm -hmm. And like, they look bad. And I don't, I don't want to send a baby out and have somebody be like, oh, it has a mite and spread rumors. You know, not the same as a snake mite. They just, they like wood. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, and, like, and I think anyone I think who's got gotten... some, so I need to deal with that. <laughs> I mean, anyone who's ever gotten any type of uh, wood bedding, I mean, Aspen, I get it all the time, yeah. uh, especially if you're going to like your your uh, farm supply stores and stuff like that. I seem to always get mm -hmm. them in those. Yeah. Um, at Reptiles by Mac, we use seven dust to cut down on that. So I will probably look into getting some of that myself. What is that? Is that like some type of almost like diatomaceous earth? It's a pesticide. <laughs> Um, oh. use, a pretty, use a pretty small amount. It's a, it's a powdered um, thing. Usually people use it for like gardening. Um, you don't use a big amount, but it seems to do the trick when it comes to wood mites. So I, I never saw any at Reptiles by Mac. So. so I'm guessing it's something that like lacerates the mites on a microscopic level. I don't and remember so it doesn't how affect it the snake. I, I don't remember how it works. I think it has perithrins in it. I think it's a small amount, but it's probably controversial to some people at least you know hey if it works it works and if it works for you then yeah i i never saw too many problems i mean like you know people freak out about you know oh don't use pesticides your snakes will get sick i didn't really see a lot of issues with illnesses and i mean this was a big operation where yeah. you know i mean we'd occasionally see like a sick animal but you know it's gonna happen in in large numbers you're gonna get some illnesses um but i don't i don't think it was from that yeah, and there's probably no better uh, sample size to go off of than, you know, keeping thousands and thousands of snakes. I mean, yeah. if it was bad for them, then they probably wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if it cost them money, absolutely not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. So what really, uh, what got you into, I mean, what made you make the transition from keeping to breeding really besides the getting a bunch of new morphs and stuff like that? I mean, were you nervous, like the business side of it or anything <laughs> like that? Oh man, as far as the business side, yeah, I was terrified. Um, I, you know, when I was reading about, you know, like starting it up and everybody was like, oh, you got to treat it like a business, make sure you get all your finances in order. I was like, I don't have any experience or knowledge about like 
bookkeeping or any of that. I've managed to dirt through it fa fairly well so far. Um, I do file taxes every year. Um, haven't had to pay any, I don't think, except for one year because I haven't had many good years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do the same thing. I just spend everything that but, I make so that I never have to. But as far as like how I got into it, um, it, it was kind of just that, that, you know, creativity. Um, you know, I, I've talked at length with, with Dawn about that, where it's like, we, we breed because we want to see what we can do. Um, you know, I want to see what, what I can do with the morphs that I have, not just produce more of the same, but to make new stuff. I want to make things that nobody's ever seen before. Um, and that maybe nobody's ever even thought of. And that's not always the most profitable um, way to do things, uh, as I've learned. But, um, you know, some people appreciate it. And that's probably good enough. Uh, I do want to diversify as far as, like, species go. Um, I love corn snakes, but, like, I want to do bigger things. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think I, uh, especially going that route, you really got to like carve your own path. And since you're working with all recessives, it's such a long term uh, project in order to see to fruition. And no one really cares yeah. about hats and corn snakes a lot when it comes to selling. Yes. Every time I look at like my ball python breeding friends, I'm just <laughs> like, I want to do that. But I don't really. But I kind of I wish I could just put two together and get what I want right away. Ah, it drives me insane. I wish there were more dominant morphs in, in corn steaks. It makes me very sad that there's only like three. Four. Yeah. I'm three. unsure if, if yeah. I like Tessera the most or it's just because it's the easiest to see results from. <laughs> but I love really? putting no, that's, Tessera into everything. That's it. Um, my, my one world first was because I put Tessera in something. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's the spirit. Oh, that was it. It was just, you know, dominant morph. Yay. Yeah. I, I was two dominants. It was it was Tessera and Buff. Um I made well actually no, technically it was three. Um and I think it was the first time anybody put three dominant morphs together. Um, because it was Tessera, Red Factor Buff. Um Ooh. I know you've got Red Factor Buff now too. Um I was the second to do that. Um somebody in Europe beat me to it by a couple of years. And she was sharing some pictures and I was like, all right, cool, this this should be this should be great. So I put Tessera into it, so I I made a you know, world first, whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, but that's super fun as far as who cares how you got there. You made something that no one else has seen before. Yeah, and it, it kind of got that bug out of my system a little bit, you know, because like, you know, when, when everybody starts, it's like, oh, I want to, I want to make this first. I want to do it for anybody else. And then like somebody beats you to it and it's like, oh. And at the end of the day, it's not like there's going to be like a parade in town or anything yeah, for it you. <laughs> like nobody, nobody cares. Nobody's going to remember that. You know, nobody remembers who made the first hypo lavender or any of that crap. Like, whatever. So, you know, I just I thought it would be fun and I did it and it was fun and I moved on. So, yeah. Now I, I have my my sight set on something else that I don't think anybody's made and I don't think anybody's working on. But we'll see. Um uh, I don't think I'm gonna say what that is. <laughs> well, that's fair. <laughs> well, how is your how is your breeding season going thus far? Um, kind of hit or miss. Um, some success, which is good. Um, I do have six potential clutches. I've got four in the incub well, three in the incubator. One is hatched. Um, I've got sunkissed and sunkissed hypos that are getting ready to shed for the first time. So those will be getting their first meal probably in a week or two. Um, but otherwise, I've got two clutches waiting to lay. Um, but I have like four or five females that I was hoping to breed this year. And they're just not into it. And now the males are just like, yeah, nah. So I don't think that's going to happen this year. So, very so sad. Girls... I strawberry pa pairings that I really hoped they would go. And I was trying to make lavender buffs this year. And nah, it's, it's just not happening. Were those females virgins? I mean, coming up on three years or a um, couple of them, yes, but a couple of them are like five. Uh, one has been a consistent breeder for me. The the hypo weirdos that hatched out the castagna things, um, they didn't go this year, and mm. they've gone every year. So I don't know what their deal was. I think they just wanted a break. And she's huge, so like she's in good condition, but she wants to year off. I guess she can have it. Yeah. So what do you do as far as a uh, brumation goes? I don't. <laughs> I wish I had the space to. Um, 
I would like to make an attempt maybe after, you know, after the, the breeding season, hatching season, all that. Also, by the way, Sarah, hi, I didn't see you. Um, <laughs> I may have sent people links to your channel. That's amazing. I appreciate it. <laughs> I was kind of hoping to see more familiar faces, but it's okay. Um, yeah, be, way to not show up, guys. <laughs> I'm sure some people will watch later. Um, they, they would just distract me. I'm very easy to distract, if you hadn't already noticed. Um, what was I talking about? <laughs> Brumating. I was going to yeah, um, yeah, so the, the bathroom that I took over this year for incubation, um, I would like to try to cool that room if I can. I don't know if it's possible, but I'm going to look into it um, to see if I can roommate this year. We are planning to move to a house, which will make it much, much, much easier to do all of this stuff. And I'll also have the room to expand, hopefully. Um, at least that's in the plan. But uh, we've been saying every year for like five years, like, oh, yeah, we're going to move next year. And then it just doesn't happen. So we don't like change. Change sucks. It's hard. <laughs> But don't you want to just like put uh, your corn snakes in a garage or somewhere to take advantage of the Ohio winter, get a nice brumation in? You realize Ohio winters get like in the negatives, like pretty, yeah. pretty far negatives. Well, obviously you don't want it to be negative, yeah. but keep it up we to 50 degrees have, or so. We don't have an ad attached garage. It's like we're in an apartment. So then there's like the separate apartment or the separate like garage building. It's not heated. So mm -hmm. there's no way. Uh, we don't have an outside shed or anything like that. I mean, like I could maybe build something, but I would be really hesitant to trust anything I built. So um, a friend of mine actually sent me a, a really good idea. Um, he actually built a little chamber that he attached to a wine fridge um, mm -hmm. made out of insulation foam. And I was like, you know, I can make that work. Like, I think I think I can make that work. So we'll see. Uh, I'll, I'm going to look into it because I really do want everybody on the same schedule. It is such a pain trying to figure out, are you ovulating or are you just gassy? Like, <laughs> Oh, so your, yeah. your females won't necessarily be. Yeah. Synced. Oh yeah. No, they were, they were all over the place. Like I said, I've got, I've got eggs waiting to be laid and I've got eggs that hatch. So we're, we're all kind of spread out. So it's very possible that some of them will still go, but I'm not holding my breath. So. so what are you doing? Because obviously, as so many roommates, like I don't have to be that attentive, to, honestly, for when a uh, female ovulates. So like, how do you go about keeping an eye on that? Um, so I found that for some of my females, especially um, just running my hand on their back, I can tell like how they react to that. Um, I have a couple that will if they're ready, like they will just lift their tail like instantly. I'm just like, okay, you're ready. I'll throw a mail in. They go. Um, some of it, I, I just, I watch for that body swelling, you know, that, you know, if they're eating extra voraciously, um, mostly I just throw a mail in once a week and see what happens. So, you know, I've got a few females that are not particularly friendly, so I try not to mess with them too much. So I pretty much just kind of have to guess with them. So, yeah. Yeah. That's always fun. So, what as as far as and for people who who don't know, I mean, corn snakes in general are pretty tractable animals. So, um, what would you say oh, about yeah. like the temperament of for the most part? I mean, for the most part, they they just they don't care. I, I can pick them up, and they're like, "Oh, you're not feeding me? Oh, okay, this is fine." They'll just wander, you know, whatever. Um, I have you know two that are a little defensive at first, and then once they're out, they're fine. You know, they're just you know okay. I'm not eating, and you're not gonna kill me, so we're we're good. Um, I have one male that absolutely is out for blood. Um, I do not mess with him at all. He is, and he's my, he's one of my biggest ones too. So he's just like, he, he draws blood like big time. Um, so I, I just hook him cause it's easier. I don't like getting bit, especially by, by some of the bigger ones. Um, I, I maybe a little bit of a wuss when it comes to getting bit like babies, you know, whatever you can chew on me all day, but like the big ones, mm, no, nah, we're going to, we're going to have to train you. So usually he's pretty good with the hook. So, you know, I can move him around without any issues. Yeah. I think that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a wuss about it too. I, I hook, I hook adults. 
it's the pain because like if they if they get you in a, in a really sensitive spot then it's like it kind of hurts for a while i had a tooth just... in my thumb like yes. i was feeding i was feeding a mouse and he missed and hit my thumb and i had a tooth in my thumb for like i swear it was a week and a half or two weeks yeah. and it hurt it's a pain you know it's it's not about you know being afraid of getting bit it's just it's inconvenient i don't like it so i just avoid it you know as, as much as possible um, I have a few juveniles that are that are very defensive. Um, one of them, she doesn't bite; she just freezes. Like she will just not move, and it's the funniest thing in the world because I I thought for the longest time that she was just really sweet and that she just didn't feel like moving. I thought she was like a ball python in a snake, you know, body. No, she's just really in petrified. a snake body. I like it. <laughs> I like how you don't even <laughs> body. Um, but she, I, like one one day, um, I I kind of freaked her out at some point, and she just like turned on me, and I was like, "What? I thought you were just really nice." No, she was just really scared. Wow. So, so I try to leave her alone too. I don't I don't mess with her as much. Um, and we we get along. She eats, and we're happy. So, yeah. and I'm sure you see a little bit of a shift around this time of the year on on a lot of your animals. Mm, I guess not. Not really, not a lot. Really? I mean, like the, the girls are more hungry, so I have to watch my hands when I like, you know, especially my sun kiss, um, Akiri. She, she's a, you know, bite first, ask questions later, and it's not an aggressive thing. It's not a defensive thing. She just really likes food. Um, so anytime I open the cage, she thinks she's getting fed. Um, so I have to like open it and then show her there's no mouse. It's okay. And like, I'll kind of get her attention with one hand and then like, you know, scoop under her with the other. And she's like, Oh, okay, this is fine. So she's, she's a real sweetheart. Just she's real hungry. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's kind of at, in a nutshell. I mean, that's what I experienced with my females as well. Yeah. Um, and my males, I think it's even worse because I feed them less. <laughs> So they're yeah, I do the same thing. <laughs> like they're all really chill, except for that one. They're all really chill. But like, if I open the cage, they're immediately looking like, "Is there food? I think there's food." Especially my palmetto, he just like gives me this intense stare. Like, why is there no food? Mine are just extra wiry and attentive. Well, I don't know. Lights well, are just out. Died. That's weird. Well, there you go. My you. Power. Uh, my power Wait, didn't die. Is your power off? Uh oh. Haunted podcast. Well, if you need to go do something, I can talk. <laughs> or you just do the rest of the interview in the dark. It's up to you. I mean, can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. I thought you were like acting like I was just gone and I was like, no, oh, I'm no. Still here. Um, yeah, I don't know why those turned off. Hang on one second. Okay, no, that was weird. I'll leave the other one off, but I think they were just off long enough, or they were just sitting long enough that they just decided to turn off. I have no idea. That was really strange. Anyway, let's continue. <laughs> so, females, what are you feeding this time of year? I mean, how often are you feeding? Um, right now I'm just feeding once a week. Um, usually before like everybody lays, sorry, excuse me. Um, before everybody breeds, um, I start ramping up feeding usually after the first of the year. Um, I will feed twice a week. Um, sometimes I haven't as much as I should. Um, you know, it's one of the mantras that I've always heard repeated It's feed to breed, feed to breed. Um, I did better this year than I have in the past, um, about just like throwing mice at them constantly, but it, it hasn't been as consistent as I would have liked. Um, I get lazy. I get lazy about feeding. I'm just like, oh, I get feed tomorrow. And then tomorrow becomes like next week. And it's like, okay, well, you only got fed once this week. It's fine. Um, I'm, but like, uh, I'm the same way, by the way. So yeah, like I, my goal for like my hatchlings is to feed every five days. And that usually turns into every seven days because I will just put it off. I'm like, ah, it's fine. I'll just wait. And then I'll just do it the next Monday instead of like the Monday, Friday, Wednesday thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to make a schedule for myself, but I, I mean, I probably should. I, but, every uh, time I try, I follow it for like a couple of weeks and then I just stop. So yeah, it gets, it gets bad. I have like a, I, I have a clipboard with a chart for like all of my snakes and it has like the dates that I intend to feed. 
and most of the time it's like a day or two before or after like one of those days <laughs> because it's just sort of in between because <laughs> mm. I just kept putting it off. So, yeah, I think oftentimes I, uh, I'm it, busy trying to figure out like, all right, I'm, I'm feeding now I'm pairing now I'm cleaning now. Um, to get that window correct. And then, and then once you're pairing, it's hard to feed twice a week. Cause it's like, oh my God, yes. I just fed. So I'm not going to pair the day after I just fed. And now it's the second or third day. And they're all going to go to the bathroom when I pair them. Yep. Yep. So. Always. <laughs> and like the, then they'll crawl, crawl through it. And Oh God. Yeah. I've had so many times where like the female will just shit all over the male. It's like, what are you doing? Stop it. And the yeah. male leaves his own trail and they yep. go all over and, that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like they're, they're <laughs> gross. Like animals are gross. But do you, <laughs> do you do like the whole, you know, are you taking um, the male and the female out and putting them in a neutral? Sometimes um, for some of mine, I think that works better, but for the most part, I just put the male in with the female or if it's, in the case of that one very defensive male, I will put females in with him um, so that he's not disturbed and upset because he will get upset. Um, but if I put a female in there, he's usually like, oh, okay, this is my territory. And what's up, baby? <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> um, he has not bred this year. Um, I'm very disappointed, but we'll see if maybe later this year. I don't know. Uh, that whole group hasn't gone this year at all. And I'm, I'm, supremely disappointed because they got some good genetics but and is that a thing i mean i have i have certain females to which if i've reproduced with them before it seems as though um i have this certain animal that i know always goes a little bit later i have this one who's always the first i mean do you see that yeah oh definitely um my my son kissed carrie that that bred first this year and laid first this year um she's always early um and that's why I was surprised that that my my hypo pet Castanya Motley thing, um, she didn't because she usually is first. Um, she always bred first, um, usually by several weeks. So that's why I don't I don't think she's going to go this year at all. Um, I think we've we've completely missed that window. I don't think she's going to ovulate a second time. It's just not going to happen. So, um, and I don't I don't think she's ever double clutched either. I can't remember, but I don't think so. That's another thing, I guess, you know, right after you just had some females that laid, I mean, what's the recovery process? Are you looking for them to double clutch? What are you doing? It depends on how they look after they lay. Um, And if I know that they will continue to eat, I've had some females that will not eat at all during the season. Like they will take a meal here or there, but they, they just, they won't eat consistently. Um, I will absolutely not double clutch them. And I will usually give them like the next year off. So like I have um, one female that I don't know how she's going to do because this is kind of a first time for her um, with at least with a fertile clutch. She laid an infertile clutch last year and she took a little while to bounce back, but she did. And I mean, she was good weight, real strong this year. So I bred her um, to the tiniest fail. Okay. This guy is 80 grams. (laughs) and He was all over her. They, they finished up and he was courting her again. Wow. And she was into it. So I just let them. Um, And she looks huge. So I'm pretty sure he got the job done, which is really impressive for how tiny this guy is. Um, I'm jealous. I tried (laughs) to run a couple really small males like this this year. And undersized. He's just he's older, but he's just really, really small for his age because he's like two years old. So like he should be like 200 grams, but he's just, you know, he's a little shrimpy guy. Um, But he was into it. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think age is honestly probably the most important factor. I think so. I really think it that they need to be old enough to be mature. It's not just about the size. Cause I've had some big, big yearlings that just slugged out you know, females. So eh, I, I think I'm done trying first year males to, you know, to see if they, they will produce anything. Cause that, it's been, I think I've pretty much just gotten slugs. So, but two year olds, they seem to do great. So, you know, wait until your males are two. And then with that being said, I mean, are you observing them? Because say if you give that young male and you put him in overnight or something and you don't see what goes on, you may waste a whole year. Are you observing to see, yeah. you know, if each male locks? 
I typically wait and see if they lock. Um, I have had some that I've just left overnight. My Palmetto was a pretty good example of that. He was terrified of anything I put in with him. Um, it took him a while to get used to having a female with him. So I actually, last year, um, I let him live with the female that I had intended for him for the entire season. They just, they cohabbed. And he got really used to having her around. And he actually is, he's a pretty solid breeder now. Like he will actually chase a female with me watching, but he was just petrified before. Like he'd, he'd run the other direction. Um, but I, I managed to catch him last year uh, locking with, with my orchid. That's, that was what I was working on was palmetto orchid. Um, and this year they, I mean, they went at it right away. So he had no trouble, but uh, I only got one egg. Hmm. Yeah. So I have not many hatchlings. But I think I think your uh, your male and my male may be uh, cut from the same cloth because uh, my <laughs> head palmetto are. male literally would jump out of the tub whenever mm -hmm. I put him with the female. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's just like a palmetto thing or what. Like if it's in their bloodline, I, I don't know. I also pick him up and he does like the crazy flailing all over and hitting me with his head yeah. and doing weird oh, yeah. stuff. He, he was a little freaked out about being picked up at first. It's an interesting bunch, but uh, yeah, I I just paired up mine last night and they lock, so maybe uh, I'll finally get palmettos. Hopefully, I'm I'm still like years away at this point. So, and I've had this male since 2015. He he was a 2015 male. I paid way too much. I got unlucky. So, so is that is that really the one of the? I mean, that had to have been pretty soon of when you got into it. I mean, was that? Pretty much the he, dream is to make palmettos? Yes. Um, he was my second purchase um, on a payment plan because I did not have $4,000 to just drop. Um, I made Damn. Yeah, I didn't... He was, yeah, I'm not proud of that. I, I could have spent that money on a lot of other snakes. Um, like, I, I think about that. And I'm just like, I could buy a super dwarf retic for that, like, which I really, really want. And nope, nope, had to spend it on the palmetto that wouldn't breed. Um, yeah, so my my goal, my first goal was was orchid palmetto. I wanted to see if Sunkiss did anything fun um, with the palmetto gene. Sunkiss always I think we'll does that. things fun. I think we're going to see this year. Um, I saw some hets last year or two years ago, maybe two years ago. So if they breed this year, we'll see. Um, I'm excited to see what, what that does. If it does anything, um, it's possible it might not do anything. Um, usually leucism tends to mask just about everything. So uh, it's kind of hit or miss, but you know, I'm, I'm still excited to see it. And we saw, um, lavender palmettos last year and they were stunning as I expected. So yeah, we're going to keep working towards that and we'll, we'll get there eventually. So and maybe at some point I'll work Red Factor into it as well. That'll be fun. I just gave a whole bunch of people some ideas. So <laughs> have fun with that. Go, go buy some snakes. Well, uh, cherry. Some... I've got cherry lavender hats uh, mm. hatching soon. So uh, I might have some available. I've had one person asking me about them. But uh, uh, depending on the sex ratio, I may let some of those go. So we'll see. So is really uh, purple pink? Is that your your color palette oh, yeah. that you're going for now? I mean, you, you see the pink chair. Yeah, I like I like girly shit. Um, just, that's just me. So. No, I think that's a good that's a good thing that I mean, corn snakes does as far as uh, the the color palette. There's almost there's gonna be no, not many purples and pinks elsewhere. And uh, yeah, not really activity right now. And like. Every time somebody posts like a really nice lavender, everybody drools over it. So like, you know, other people want it too. So it's not just, you know, I, I like them, but also other people like them too. So, you know, it's, it seemed like a reasonable, like financially viable choice. So. Yeah, I guess that is, that does kind of factor into it, huh? Like, especially in corn snakes, I feel like it's pretty, pretty important as far as uh, knowing your market and what's going on and, uh, 
you can have some really specialty projects that there's a very few people who are going to be interested in, or you have something that ends up being a pink snake or even the things that are easy to make, you know, even if you can make a bunch of snows, you'd probably be better off than some of the higher end projects. But. Oh yeah. Yeah. Snows sell like hotcakes. Um, and especially overseas, <laughs> if you want something to ship to China, ship them white snakes. They love white snakes. Um, and it's because of that, that legend of, um, you know, the, the white snake that turned into a beautiful girl or something like that. I, I can't remember. Mm. Um, that's like a really popular like legend. So, um, it's like some old folklore. So oh, yeah, white, white snakes are very popular in China. So whenever yeah, I know that they were getting black snakes and white snakes, they were getting mm -hmm. Mexican black king snakes over there. Yeah. Well, I mean, some of that was just the popularity from here also kind of spilling over because like that was the trend for the last few years is black snakes. Everybody wants black snakes. So Mexican black king prices went up. Um, not all black species went up. I mean, nobody really wants black rats. I don't know why. They're pretty cool. Like, and some of the morphs in black rats are really awesome, like or in eastern rats. Um, I saw a hypo lavender eastern rat that I if I just glanced at it, I would swear it was a corn snake. It was just, it was beautiful. So, and they're, they have great personalities too. They get bigger. So yeah. You know, you something that's big and chill. Yeah. Eastern rat. I can't have them here cause they're native. So oh, I can, really? I can with a permit, but like I can have up to four and then, you know, can't really breed them. So. But you I were, probably, you were hinting them. at uh, possibly, moving on or expanding into different species and you yeah. mentioned super dwarfs so is that really first on your uh, list it's definitely top um i actually planned to buy my first super dwarf this year and that didn't happen partially because of covid19 i yeah you know, i quit my job at PetSmart. um I don't really have much in the way of income right now. So I don't really have the extra money to spend. And I was like, well, you know, I'll get the stimulus and I'll get that, you know, I'll spend that. And no, uh, half of that has gone to mice. So <laughs> it's a tough time of year for all this. You yeah, know. It's, it's rough. And I mean, like, I, I feel bad because I've absolutely talked Garrett's head off about like ideas and stuff like the, the things that I want are kind of on the same par as that palmetto orchid. Like I want to make you know, snow cows. And he was like, Oh, that's a big goal. And I'm like, yep, <laughs> I dream big. Um, but I mean, I, that's, you know, probably a $20,000 investment. So I don't have that kind of money to spend right now. It's one hell of a payment <laughs> plan. for a while. So, <laughs> so someone else will be, that's fine. But you're, but you're really going for things that are drastic looking. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I like what I like. I like spotted purple pink snakes, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> At least I, mean, I think I do. I don't, well, I mean, I liked the the lavender palmettos that I saw. They were pretty hot. So I'd like to see them as adults. I've only seen babies. So we'll see what they, you know, mature into. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I have a type. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I also would love to get into green tree pythons, which I know you have. Um I'm not really sure where to start there. So I, I haven't really done a lot of research yet. I'm, I don't really have the space for more arboreal stuff. Um, I have, uh, I just got a pair of um, Solomon Island tree boas. That's kind of my first foray outside of, of corn snakes, outside of my, my one ball python that was a rescue. So he was just surrendered to me. Um, what so species that's, that's are those? Candoya? Yeah, they're Candoia bibernae australis. Um, uh, so they're they're uh, they're tiny, they're being, aren't they? Uh, they're, well, they're small right now. The female, I think, the male probably will get a little bit bigger, but the female should get quite a bit larger. Um, I mean, I've heard stories of them hitting six, seven feet. Really? I don't, I don't think she'll actually get that big. Like, I think that's you know top end. Um, but they're they're not big around. They're very slender, um, very long, and I told that they're really nice um i've already been bitten but <laughs> you know the male really doesn't like me either but he's just shy he just tucks his head down and is like no don't hurt me um but he he came in looking pretty rough um i mean they're both imports so like you know it's a little, little touch and go with it in that in general um but he Are they eating was, rodents 
I haven't tried to feed them yet. I just got them recently. Um, I'm getting ready to feed them probably tomorrow. Um, they were eating scented and I have some, um, like some anole and gecko juice uh, and frog juice coming from reptilinks, but that probably won't be here till next week. So I'm going to see if they'll eat unscented. And if not, then they'll get scented next week. Um, but uh, they, I mean, they, have pretty slow metabolisms. At least that's kind of the going theory. So they should be okay for a little while. They look fine. Um, the female seems very strong, uh, <laughs> very strong. Uh, she she kind of let me know that she was not a weakling, <laughs> but um, the male had a really really bad shed. So I gave him a wet hide, and he was soaking in his water bowl, and he managed to get it all off on his own. So I didn't have to try to peel shed off of a very delicate tree snake body. I was really happy about that. So. We'll see how how he, you know, deals from here, and and we'll see how they how they survive. Uh, cap or um, imports, they don't always do the best. So, and yeah, and I've heard people, those are very tricky as well. Yeah. Almost nobody's bred them. Um, I think some people in Indonesia have bred them, and I think a couple of people in the states have. Um, there's a couple of people I need to get into contact with, but I I'm, can I can hook you up with someone. Okay. Um, I know Joshua Parker used to keep them, um, and I don't know if he still has. He might have other Candoia now, but I don't know. Uh, he went into pretty like in depth, like com you know, stuff about them on uh, I think the Morelia Python Radio uh, interview that he did. So I got a lot of information from that, which was nice. So. Yeah, it's with those species that I mean, not only is it getting away from corn snakes, but you're really into some. Uh, somewhat unknown territory yeah, yeah uh it's a risk uh, i i had to try it so i think they're really cool um and it was it was kind of dan maleri that got me into them initially because i was watching his videos about you know his imports and like some of the the babies that that were born there and it was just like oh they're so cool i have to have them they look so alien and like freaky so i will see how they do um obviously i'm gonna need more males at some point if I actually want to try to breed them, but I'm not worried about that for a while. Uh, they, they seem to need a lot of time to mature. So we're just going to see how they do for the next few years. So. Nice. How do you have them set up at the moment? I mean, do you have them together? Or separate? <laughs> I have them together in a very small cage. Um, it's in a 10 gallon, <laughs> so it's pretty tiny, but it's just like, I've got like branches and like leaves and stuff all over the place so they can climb if they want to. They never do. Uh, really? They, they are just spending all their time on the ground for the most part. But the female will come out and she'll kind of look at me like, what's up? What are you? Um, the male just hides. Like I said, he's really, really shy. But uh, yeah, they, they seem to spend more time on the ground than they do up in the branches. So I know that they do climb around. At least during the day, around. I guess. When you, when yeah, you during the them. day. they hide. I think at night they come out and they climb around because everything will be like kind of tousled, you know during the night so i'm i'm happy that they're using the the climbing space and stuff i just i wish i would see more of them so we'll see when i move them to i i've got a bioactive cage um i do plan on keeping them together um especially since they're so small like they're they're just they're really tiny they're like the size of yearling corns when they're curled up and uh so I have a, a 40 gallon that's just got all kinds of cross branching and live plants and lots of hiding places. If they just really want to hide all the time, they totally can. They've got plenty of choices. So we'll see how they do in that eventually, but I want to make sure that, you know, they're eating first. So. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's the, the biggest thing in the beginning is just please, please little guys eat. Yeah. So where did you go as far as, uh, did you source them out in particular? Did you end up getting them from Dan or did you catch them at a reptile <laughs> show or something? I messaged him earlier in the year and he was like, oh, well, it's kind of cold right now. So maybe message me later in the year. And then he just didn't have any. <laughs> he, I think he sold them at the show um, that he went to. So um, I, I ended up getting them from Triple L Reptile because they had a handful. Um, they said they had six at the time. And then they messaged me and were like, oh, we only have a pair left. And I'm like, okay, I'll just take them. Sure. Like they sent me pictures. I was like, okay, they, they, they're alive. <laughs> like, they <laughs> they were alive. Uh, I yeah. trust them that they're eating. So, you know, it's, it's always iffy buying from some of these companies, you know, underground reptiles is another one I was looking at. And like, everybody is just like, Oh, never go to underground reptiles. They're terrible. And I'm like, 
I know people that buy from them every. If you day. know what to expect, every then day. you know how to you know you know how to treat the animal, and you know yeah. what you're in for. Um, fortunately, my exotic set has a lot of experience with not just Candoia, but also with imports and with a lot of other exotic species. So he's pretty good about you know being able to help with things like deworming and making sure they're healthy and stuff like that. So I'm not, I'm not too worried. Um, you know, I know there's still a chance they might just die out of nowhere. So it's, it's a risk, but eh, they're pretty and cool. Did, did you consider, I mean, treating them beforehand or you really just want to see how they do before you even um, think about it's, that? It's a little iffy. I mean, if you just like deworm a freshman wild snake, you can just kill it outright. Like it, it can literally just kill them. Um, you really have to treat them with care. Um, I want to make sure that they're eating regularly before I ever approach the idea of deworming or doing anything like that. Um, and it's kind of hard to get like a vet appointment right now. I think that um, the state of Ohio is opening up pretty soon to like vet appointments. So I should be able to get in to see um, Dr. Calhoun for that. But, you know, we're, we're going to kind of have to wait on that. But if I can give them established eating, then I'll definitely feel better about that for a while. And then we'll deal with the worms later. So I'm sure they have some kind of parasite. Yeah. But you're, uh, at least you're no stranger to uh, scenting mice, I'm sure. Hmm? I'm sorry. I was reading chat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was saying good thing. Uh, corn the last... probably... huh? Go ahead. Sorry. Corn snakes have probably made you uh, a little bit accustomed to scenting rodents and stuff like that and yeah, really with. um you know i haven't really had to do that very much but you know i need to send you some key good. stuff but i i did you know that wasn't the only reason that i ordered the scenting products that i did from from reptilinks um it, it is partially for babies just in case so you know i'll have the an old juice and the gecko juice and, you know hopefully we can get everybody eating quickly um but yeah, that, that was what I was going to try to answer. Um, so maternal incubation doesn't really work for colubrids because they, they'll they sit on the nest for a little while and then they just leave. Like they just, they they hightail it out of there. Um, but I incubate the way that Garrett Hartle incubates. Um, he actually has a video on his channel about how he built his incubator and I did the exact same thing. Um, so I would check out Reach Out Reptiles and look up like incubator in his like search Um and that's that's how I incubate. I use a big cooler with aquarium heaters, and yeah, works really well. Great humidity, absolutely phenomenal. Um, I also have some reptivators that I use as a spare. That's what I used to use, just primarily. But um, one of them, I I have a friend that has some leopard geckos that she didn't know one was male, so she's incubating some eggs. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, that who hasn't? Yeah, who who hasn't hatched out their first clutch in a hova baiter? Uh, Come yeah. on, that's classic. Well, it's it's the the reptibator, so it's like the green one. It's fancy. Oh, so it's like it's catered towards reptiles, but it's the same thing. It's just a different color. It's it's got a little more space, um, uh -huh. and I actually can fit four of the. There's these Sterilite flip tops. Um, you can fit four of those in one of those things, and that's actually what I use to incubate um, for, you know up until this year. So, so I'm trying to think it's a, the little clear one. It's like a little bit, it's like a pencil. No, it's not a pencil box, but it's smaller than a shoe box. And it. I don't have one down here. Otherwise I'd grab it, but it's like, it's square ish. Like it's like this big and it just has a top that just flips open. Um, it's not very airtight. So you do have to kind of watch humidity, but you can fit four of them like perfectly inside one of those things. So it's really great for small breeders that only have a few small clutches and it's a little bit cramped, but you can fit, you know, a corn snake clutch in that as long as it's not like 20 or more. I think I actually managed to fit 20 some eggs in one mm -hmm. once and it worked out just fine. I just pulled babies as they hatched. <laughs> That's always, yeah, that's always interesting. I've even had to do do the opposite where you have to put two clutches in one, in one thing. I have done out of space. Yeah, I've, I've done that with like, um, you know, where I had like two eggs and then like five eggs and I just, I just put them together because they were different times. So the ones, you know, that would hatch first, I pull those and just pull out the eggs and the substrate that, you know, touched all the egg goop. Um, and they usually work just fine. So 
Uh, fortunately, I don't have to do that now. I have plenty of space because um, I could fit like, I think 16 clutches in that thing. So in the little, little containers, but I'm using bigger ones now because I've got the room. Did you mention what, what substrate or what medium you're incubating in? Um, so I did a mix of both because I had some leftover um, vermiculite, but I actually bought a big bag of perlite this year. And I really, really like it for this particular incubator just because it already has really high humidity. I don't have to worry about making sure that it's the exact right amount of moisture. Um, I don't have to worry about using hatch right to make sure that it's wet enough. I just have to make sure it's damp and then, you know, the whole thing just stays humid. So it's perfectly fine. And what um, temps are you aiming for? 82 degrees. Um, as, as consistent as I can. Um, mine, I had some trouble when I first built this. Um, I put a fan in it the way that, that Garrett showed. And that would work if I was incubating at 90, which is what you need for pythons. But I needed to be 82. And that little fan was enough friction that it actually raised the temperature by a few degrees. So I could not get it below like 87. It was insane. Ooh. So yeah, I, had, I ended up taking it out and finally it just settled at 82. So it kind of fluctuates between 81 and 83, which is fine. Um, as long as it stays within those parameters, it's usually okay. So, I mean, corn snake eggs can tolerate pretty high heat. I mean, they could tolerate 87 degrees, but you're going to hatch really, really tiny, weak babies. So it's usually better to let them cook a little bit longer so they get a little stronger. I've heard of people incubating at room temperature and I tried that once and it did not go well. They just raw, they, they, they just died on me. Um, but I've, I've had some people say, if you just like put them over your kitchen counter or your kitchen like cabinets up at the top, um, that they'll take longer to hatch, but they'll hatch out huge, you know, like 10 grams, which is pretty big for a baby. So. I did, I did somewhere between 74 and 76 degrees and it took 96 days. Wow. <laughs> it was a dreadful weight. Whenever I tried that, they just they just failed. Like they would just mold over and just die. I don't I don't know what it was. Maybe we had too much like inconsistency in temperature. I don't know because on one on one hand, like reading the Loves book, it seemed like they kind of opened up their garage in Florida and let a lot of fluctuation happen. But sure. and then but I've had some pretty bad experiences when fluctuations happen. So, yeah. but then I'm again, like it's always going to happen to a certain degree. So I don't know whether to worry about it or not. I'm, I change yeah. from year to year because like last year I had a shitty hatching season. So I'll probably be extra careful this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I am a little worried about the, the current clutches that I have because I've been opening the incubator a lot since that clutch started hatching. You're home um, too much. Yeah, because we just were like, oh, let's check the babies. Let's see if any more are out. Like, oh, let's go look. And like he'd hear me open the door and he'd come upstairs because he wanted to see too. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, I hope that I haven't dropped the temperatures too much. We usually keep it pretty warm in here anyway, so I don't think it's a huge deal. Um, I think if we were keeping it like you know, 65 in here would probably be an issue. But like upstairs, I, I think our bedroom stays roughly 80 degrees. So like my thermostats almost never kick on. So, yeah, it's probably fine. Crossing fingers that it's fine. Yeah, I think that that's, that's one thing about breeding is that you can always kind of be humbled by that kind of stuff. So it's always like a little nerve wracking, a little. Yeah, everyone's <laughs> jealous of your chair. I bought this like forever ago. It's so beat up. Like, you can see there's this like, it's worn. Like if you could see the seat, like anything that's pleather is just scratched off. It's not it's even got some miles. Yeah. I met my computer a lot. Like a lot. Yeah. Well, uh, I think everyone is at this point. Mm -hmm. So uh, what have you been doing as far as, or are you worried about like what is going, how this is going to affect corn snake market or any of that stuff? Not really. Um, I'm not really worried about it too much. Um, I'm still seeing people buying stuff constantly. Um, it doesn't really seem like that slowed down much. Um, maybe in the coming months as people start to kind of run out of money, maybe we'll see. But um, 
I don't know. I just keep thinking of when the ball python market really started taking off. That was around the 2008 market crash when people yeah. didn't really have money, but they were buying ball pythons, let me tell you. Um, and everybody was buying them to breed. So, you know, there's there's kind of that pyramid scheme kind of thing to, to be concerned about. I guess. People are looking for alternate routes yeah. of, of income. Yeah, I think I think that just as many people, if not maybe more, are looking into breeding. So, you know, I, I think it, there's a good chance that it won't, you know, suffer too much. Now, I don't think that corn snakes are going to take off the way ball pythons did. I don't think anybody's going to be a millionaire, you know, but uh, unless they're breeding 10,000. And even then, the overhead is just insane. So, yeah, not not going to happen. You can make good money with corn snakes. Like, don't get me wrong. People always talk about, oh, you can't make money with corn snakes. Uh, people do. People make lots of money, like lots. Um, but usually it's with wholesale with very large numbers. So, and very minimal keeping. Right. Yeah, I guess, I don't know. I think for, for people like us on a smaller scale, it's kind of hard to fathom uh, keeping that way or, or having that mentality rather. Not that that's a negative, but. Uh, yeah, I mean. Like, I, I've had industry pros tell me that with a 10 by 10 room, you can make $100,000 a year in profit. And not to say I don't believe them, but I, I don't know. Also, are you willing to do what you have to do in order to? Yeah, I mean, that's that work. that's so much work. Um, the amount of hustle that you have to put into that to actually make that kind of money it's a lot so i don't know we'll see how how things go with mine i would like to eventually like make that a living um you know kyle's kind of the breadwinner anyways so i don't really need to make a lot for it to be sustainable for me i just need to be able to basically pay for my stuff which isn't a lot shout out to kyle yeah <laughs> he does okay <laughs> But that's uh, no, I think I think that's a lot of our goals is just to maybe make a little bit of money. You know, a lot of people, some side income, maybe you yeah. can I just, you know, supplemental. So. And I mean, I I definitely believe that you you can, like I said, you can make a lot of money if you really put the work in. I, I could. I think that I have the potential to um, I know how to do it, but it's a matter of do I really want to put that kind of work into it? Maybe, probably not. Yeah, and I'd you, rather you may have to survive. sacrifice some of your some of your attention to detail as far as these. Yeah. Very, you're doing very specific projects. I mean, yeah. um, in order to and, make a living, I mean, you kind of got to hit the the <laughs> bases of what. That's it, Ryan. At least pay for the mice. Yeah, that right now that's what they're doing. They're paying for their mice. And that's that's pretty much it. The mice, the electricity, the bedding to a degree. Although, like I said, the price of Santa chip. Only barely. <laughs> but I mean, not many people can say that they can keep or breed or, you know, snakes without, you know, without spending too much or, yeah. you know, at least they pay for themselves, you know? I, I mean, especially like the people who are just like, I have a normal and I'm going to breed it to this weird red thing. What are you doing? <laughs> Stop. Take, take some time, learn just a little, just a little bit and you can actually do well. Um, but yeah, I mean, like if you, if you really want to make money breeding corns, breed, amels, breed, anneries, breed snows. Um, that's what sells. That's what moves. That's what people buy. That's what that people buy for their first, first pets. Um, that's what pet stores buy. And it's, it's for a reason. So, you know, that's, that's the key to it. Breed, breed the boring stuff if you want to make money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what yeah, I guess that was kind of my point. It's like you need to sacrifice your creative vision to in order to make a living. What? I'm not prepared to do that. No. no, way. no way. I'm keeping my weird projects. They're fun. They keep oh, me going. Yeah. And that's I mean, that's how that's what Don says too. I mean, that's what keeps him going is is the the creativity, you know, making new things. It it stimulates the imagination. So that's what I want to keep doing too. Absolutely. So uh, we blew past an hour. I mean, very, very easily. Yeah. No, I could, go, at wrapping I could go things for up. Like three hours. <laughs> yeah. That's smart. Oh, I so you. I could tell. I worked there for four years. Four years. Did, did you work in like a particular department or? 
Mm, yeah, we don't really have departments. There's I have no the idea how this works. Are, okay, so at PetSmart, there are the people who can work with the animals, and then there are the cashiers and stalkers. They are not allowed to work with the animals. They they can't get them out of the enclosures or like touch them or anything. And then there's obviously like the salon, the grooming salon, that's totally separate, completely different. It's almost like a different business that just exists within PetSmart. Um, but they, I mean, they'll still you know work on the floor if they need to, especially if like they run out of dogs. But uh, but I was I was pet care, which is now core, which means you do everything. So yeah, I had to know how to do everything except groom. Did you at least get first pick on some cool looking animals or anything? Yeah. Um, I mean, we could hold stuff back and, and buy it as soon as it came in. Um, that didn't happen often, but every now and then we get some cool stuff. But mostly it was just, you know, the same old, same old. We'd get normal ball pythons. We'd get the occasional Oka tea that was just a normal. You know. um, every now and then we'd get really cool uh, king snakes. So, like, we got some Floridanas that were really sweet, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I know my my buddy in the chat, he, uh, I don't know if it's PetSmart or Petco, but he got, like, some Goin' Eye, he, and there's some, like, cool Florida, Florida King Morse and stuff like that. Yeah, um, somebody, uh, well, right after I quit um, <laughs> the, for the second time, I actually have quit twice. Uh, so they talked, they <laughs> At talked the same store? Yes, they talked me into coming back. They were like, we need you. And I'm like, I know you do. <laughs> they gave me a raise, so there was that. Um, and I was I was just lazy. I didn't want to apply anywhere else. I was like, I have a guaranteed job here, so why not? You know. And I already know what to do. They don't have to train me, so it was easy. Um, yeah, my choice of fancy corn. Okay, look, people need to stop <laughs> ragging on the big box stores for the fancy label. If you understood how many SKUs they have to track, you would understand why they have that label. They're not going to keep, you know, Amel, Annery, Motley, Snow, Snow, Motley, Snow, Stripe, you know, Annery, Stripe. They're not going to keep separate SKUs for all those. Just, just stop, right? They're just, they're fancy. Just let it go. <laughs> and I mean, that's just more fun for the rest of us when we get exactly. to see them and you know, try to see what it is. Yeah, like, then it's a guessing game. It comes in. Oh, like you know, we get fancy ball pythons. Oh, is it is it a pastel? Is it uh, you know, Mojave? Like, who knows? One time we got a banana Mojave. That was kind of cool. <laughs> I think one of the employees bought it, but they they'd never sell it full price. They always sold them at like half price. Yeah. Yeah, it's because they fancy. They fancy as fuck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have like, you have literally tried to make this, uh, your, like you've kind of revolved your life around snakes in many ways. And for the last five years, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to, uh, I jump in with both feet. So, you know. It was it's funny because it's kind of the same here. Like we we met and like we basically moved in together. So like almost right away. And it's been it'll be seven years in August. So yeah. Wow. And which which breeding season is this for you? Wait, what? Second oh, or third okay. breeding season? You're talking about snakes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. I was like, hang on a minute. <laughs> um, yeah. So this this is my fifth season because I started. Oh, in damn. 20, so I think. Wait. Yeah. 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. This will be my fifth season. So. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So what do you have as far as uh, where can people see what you got going on? Um, so my website, I just updated today. I still had stuff from 2018 on there. So that's all gone. Um, I have a list of all of my current pairings, everything that's in the incubator and things that have hatched. Um, I don't have a morph list for the, the ones that have hatched yet because I haven't had a chance to really evaluate them. There's a few that I don't know what they are yet. Um, <laughs> I have an idea, but I don't, I, you know, I need to compare, you know, and we'll probably get like good photos right after they shed um, before I feed them. Um, so we can kind of take a look and, and see, okay, this one's a hypo, this one's not. Maybe this one's peach phase. Um, the dad is from a peach sire. So, and we think that he carries peach. I'm going to need Terry's help on that. So Terry House, uh, she's got probably more experience with peach now than I do. 
Um, so we'll see if what you know which ones are which ones are hypo, which ones are peach, which ones are both. Who knows? Maybe some of them are both. Um, I definitely have at least one normal that is different. So yeah, um, but those will get posted as soon as we get pictures. I'll post them on Instagram. Yeah, everybody will be able to see what I have. Regardless yeah. if they become available or not. Yeah. Yeah, and I think most of those will be available. I might hold one. So, you know. So if you want something cool that's Sunkissed and Hypo, yeah, I gotcha. And then I have some other projects. Um, I have all the pairings listed with all the known genetics. So you can throw it in a calculator if you need to. <laughs> but uh, you can take a guess at, at what might hatch. Awesome. So uh, what is your website, Facebook, all that stuff? Um, so it's just windserpents.com. And I actually have links to all my social media on the website. So you can just get to everything from there. And you have some of the most legit photos. So shout out to that. Okay. Those those were taken by Kyle. Um, he is the photographer. <laughs> I, I know a little bit. I've taken some and we both have our own cameras, but he takes the best ones. So I always have him take photos. Um, that was the whole reason we got into photography was mm. for making like, you know, doing commercial photo shoots. So, yeah. Well, kinda, you did it right. Perfect. Yeah. So kudos so on that. Yeah, and as far as for me, PoorCityPythons.com, PoorCityPet.com, all that good stuff, please check out Critter, Critter Con Live. I wish I could talk and say it right. May 2nd, uh, Snake Discovery, Roaming Reptiles, Crosstown Exotics, and Cold Black Exotics for only $5. Please go out and support those guys as well as me on our mission to, uh, to have a nice virtual event for all ages and uh, get some reptile education out there. So, Laura... Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. And uh, I will see you guys next week. Bye.